And we are live. Is Apple failing Siri or is Siri failing Apple? Also, Amazon is recalling six different models of Amazon Basics power banks. Is yours affected? Android Wear will be officially rebranded as Wear OS. And Broadcom abandons plans to acquire Qualcomm, which is kind of a big deal. Though we've got a lot to talk about. Make sure you're charged and ready for episode 296 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Recorded March 16th at noon Pacific, this weekly podcast is where we discuss and dissect those gadgets that make our lives mobile. Smartphones, tablets, and wearables, it's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid, and talking to your computer was a science fiction dream. Hello, computer. Hello. So I'm Juan Carlos Bag now contributing editor at pocketnow.com, joined as always by plucky podcast producer, Mr. Jules Wong. Uh, are, are you finally back from your adventures and travels? Yes, I am. I am. The land of I, Narnia? I, 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 I don't have any jet lag at all. So not uh, go at on. all. He's a machine, ladies and gentlemen. He's yeah, a trooper. I only had like a little nap at the beginning of the flight. <laughs> Uh, my snoring uh, disrupted uh, my. I was in the middle seat of the middle aisle, so uh, I was surprised to find that my um, side partners had moved away from me. So, oh, uh, but that means funny. that I got the whole little section to myself, so I could like stretch out my legs and and uh, watch Iron Giant without being disrupted by um, or having to like be uncomfortable at all. Well, I'm glad that worked out for you. I can I can definitely attest to. The manly power and aggression of your snoring. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that uh, you have uh, realized that. Although Jaime Rivera yes. has taught me some pretty cool tips, so because uh, he is also I... a manly and powerful snorer. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, uh, if you want to not sleep through this podcast, as we are broadcasting this live at 3 p.m. on uh, Friday, March 16th. Happy St. Patty's Day in advance to y'all. Uh, but uh, uh, do participate in our chat. We have this going on on Twitter with the hashtag PN Weekly. Whatever your comments you make, we'll be able to track that hashtag and uh, respond to them in real time. And if you can't do though, uh, do that. You can uh, email us with uh, your questions and any thoughts that you happen to have at podcast at pocketnow.com i had to remember that for a second i was like I it's not the hashtag it's the it's the email address so I know, email is hard it's like trying to remember someone's phone number in the 20th it's, like, it's, it's not it's not a twitter handle so you can't use the hat you have to be the at sign it has to be the the not the pound the at so i'm just right. it's yeah and 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 so, just, uh, that, that you're old enough to still call the hashtag a pound sign which is hilarious so i mean you know i mean I'm, people my age are still kind of on that threshold and most of them anyways would just call them a hashtag it's 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 the twitter or the social worlds that are combining and controlling us and uh taking over our feeds algorithms and... man i we made the joke on on new egg now last week about <laughs> algorithms taking over our lives and i just saw that have you seen the uh, i mean you've been traveling so i know I, I would yeah. imagine that this is probably a no but um you should check out there's a documentary on what an algorithm even is and how it impacts your daily life and it's actually a pretty well produced uh, piece of media i i, I really enjoyed it yeah, I love all these formulas and uh, things that are set by people in order to achieve a certain result between the mm -hmm. ranges and uh, things. And um, you have to stop me right here because otherwise <laughs> I'm going to go into a whole. We'll just we'll, we'll turn this into a completely different show. I, you know, so yes, yeah. please join the, the the conversation. We already have a couple tweets coming in using that PN Weekly hashtag. Of course, I see Mr. Andrew Wallace, Mr. Fat Produce. Um, on Twitter, uh, a, a guest of the podcast and a longtime viewer. Uh, I, I'm always I always get his name mm. wrong. M Mir Rang the the meme rang a lot. The the meme guy uh, also uh, <laughs> you know has, has tweeted us. And, and He's a meme guy. Uh, some some PM I, I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that question in a little bit. Mr. Peter Hayton also joining the show. Thank you so much. Uh, we always appreciate that conversation, that live chatter. Definitely hit that PN Weekly. But uh, I think we need to jump straight into some news because we've got some big news that we're going to be covering after the middle of our show in the ad break. But we also have some really interesting stories, the top stories from Pocket Now this week. 
uh, just all the uh, smartphone and mobile news that's fit to consume. Yeah, indeed. For the week of March 12, 2018, this is all of the mobile tech news that is fit to podcast. The information spoke to former Apple employees working on Siri who have said that the company never had a cohesive vision, never had consistent and strong leadership, and has been left behind by the likes of Amazon and Google. Speaking of Apple, the company has plans for a March 27 event to address the needs of educators. It's expected that new iPad Pro models in 11-inch and 13-inch sizes, as well as an entry-level 13-inch MacBook, will be announced. Amazon is voluntarily making a recall. Six variants of its Amazon Basics portable power banks are deemed at risk to catch, excuse me, to catch fire and cause damage to skin and property. Users should check on PocketNow.com if their item is affected, and if it is, contact Amazon for disposal and a full refund. Android Wear is becoming Wear OS. Google announced the branding change just ahead of Basel World, the world's largest trade show for jewelry and watches. The move acknowledges that Android OEMs have less to do with the platform than legacy watch brands, and the fact that a third of device activations in 2017 were paired with iPhones. HTC is working on a project called Imagine, what we've been calling the U12, what we believe at least. Evan Blast, reporting for VentureBeat, has been told that this would come out, uh, this could come out as the U12 Plus instead. Not clear if uh, we'll be getting two devices at once or if there's just one device that we're talking about. It has four cameras, EdgeSense 2.0, a bigger display with lesser uh, bezels, and much, much more. While there have been a few delays, it should be out late this spring. And finally, today is the day sales begin for the Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus. Deals are all about. And again, you can check Pocket Now for those at, or at your local carrier if you want to. If you pre ordered your unit in the US and are on one of the CDM carry, uh, CDMA carriers of the nation, you may have gotten a Verizon SIM instead of the Sprint one that you wanted. Samsung and Sprint have apologized, and customers are getting new SIMs shipped overnight. So uh, with all that going through, um, let's uh, start at the top, talk about Siri, and talk about the claims here made by, again, former employees, as well as one of the heads of uh, the Siri team at the time. When it, uh, Between 2010 and 2011, they were working on Siri, which they had acquired from mm -hmm. as, as a startup uh, that was spun off of a paramilitary kind of or, um uh, private business. And uh, between the, uh, 2010 and 2011, it sounded like they had a bunch of trouble between both Apple Maps, which was in development at the time, and we ended up knowing how much of a of a disaster that was at launch, uh, and <laughs> Siri, which um, was, like it was a novelty, but I couldn't say that it was popular or well, like the, it was a, a the, hot the thing. thing is like siri was acquired and it was a product of its time we we've been trying to crack this nut um better voice actions better voice controls since the early days of cell phones not even of smartphones and uh, i recently took a spin back uh using an htc touch pro and microsoft voice actions from that time uh you if uh, people remember blackberry there were different apps and services you could use for enhanced voice actions like Vlingo, uh, that everyone was trying to get us to that science fiction masterpiece, communicate with your gadget and with your data and with your services by uttering voice commands. So Siri, for when Siri was acquired by Apple, I think was sort of that step towards trying to catch Apple, the iOS ecosystem up to the functionality that uh, these other platforms had. Microsoft's voice actions were, I mean, you had to memorize what the syntax of your command was, but it was pretty capable and it was still one of the best voice calling, uh, you know, like, you know, call my wife and it would call my wife. And, and like, it seemed to work even more consistently back then than our current super smart machine learning assistants work today. Every time I say, you know, I, I use my wife's name, it'll pull every contact that has my wife's middle name which is 
almost all of the female members of my family. So my wife's <laughs> name is Marie. And I was like, call Marie back now. And they'll be like, well, do you mean uh, Christina Marie, Bridget Marie, Yvonne Marie? You're like, no, no, I don't. Google, I've been using you for years. You should know who my wife is by now. And I have to set up like a nickname. So I, I, so my, I have to remember that when I want to call my wife, I have to say call wife. I can't use my wife's name. Um, so, you know, I, I think most people would be of, of the, I don't think there'd be a lot of disagreement that Siri has not kept pace. Uh, even some of the more recent updates to Bixby, while I don't think Bixby's in any danger of reaching that critical tipping point of being the voice assistant that wins, it's delivering some really formidable macro functionality. You know, your ability to control multiple actions with a single command is pretty awesome. And you would think that Apple, with its ecosystem, really trying to get HomeKit and, and home automation up off the ground, that they'd be leading the way on that. Uh, Apple makes well, the that, argument I mean, for ecosystem all the time, but they don't seem to have found the push for what gets Siri not only up to the rest of the voice assistants on the market, but what actually surpasses them. And I think well, that's... It sounds awesome. like the, within the company itself, there was no, not much uh, coordination in bringing Siri to be more advanced and to be uh, more like an Alexa or a Google Assistant because these tasks, uh, you know, uh, voice calls and, and messaging, you know, they, they seem pretty simple at first and then you get more complex and you have to, and you want to be able to pay for something or you want to link to some other uh, document in space. And that, I mean, the team, it sounds like just hasn't been coordinated enough. They didn't even know that uh, HomePod, the HomePod, the smart speaker that they were working on since 2015, right. was was a thing until just shortly before it was announced. So, uh, and, and that's definitely, I think, one of the biggest challenges that faces a company like Apple, where you no longer have a design guy at the top of the company, and you have a relatively small team. Uh, the the we we say the team at Apple. And it really does feel sometimes like there are very limited resources for such a humongous, such a such a wealthy uh, organization it's, that yeah. it's they're not super just, fluid. Yeah, it's not just te like the team; it's multiple teams that work on their own thing. And Apple's leadership trusts each team to be good enough, well enough to handle these things on their own. And at some point, I mean, when the convergence comes. It's always a, a, like a hellish kind of traffic well, jam of ideas. Because at the same time, they they run their their you know sort of they they run their organization almost like skunk works, you know, where they're keeping projects highly secretive, even from other members uh, throughout the organization. And then because of that, these individual members on each team become very fluid. So when iOS has a problem, they're probably drawing resources from their machine learning or from their OS X uh, uh, departments to fill in the gaps to get projects finished so they can meet their their shipping dates. Like Apple is notoriously good at not missing a shipping date, iPhone 10 notwithstanding. But Lately, I think that's meant products which are less finished than they used to be in sort of the history of this company and more aggressive changes coming that this company is going to have a, a much more difficult time keeping pace with if they can't find ways to better coordinate and better distribute their resources across the entire organization. So uh, one of the former leaders of Siri, uh, let me just try and see, if because it's not Scott Forstall. Scott Forstall was the overhead, uh, overall head of iOS, and he was tasked with Siri, but then he passed it on to uh, Williamson, uh, excuse me, uh, this uh, person named Williamson uh, in order to work on it. And... Uh, this and uh, he said uh, this uh, decisions concerning technical leadership of the software and server infrastructure were made by employees below his at level and while he was <laughs> responsible for getting the team on the chat uh, on, on track he said that siri was a disaster after launch it was slow uh software was riddled with serious bugs um and it seems uh, he says those problems lie entirely with the original siri team certainly not me and and also i kind of feel like there's a branding problem for most virtual assistants we've we've 
I, I think there are people currently using modern iPhones who their perception of what Siri can and can't do is still informed by the first generation of Siri that they used. And they're not they're like, well, Siri couldn't do this and it was terrible for that. And they don't they won't go back and re-educate themselves as to what the platform can do now. And I think that harms Apple because they get less good information on how consumers are using those services. I think that's also one of the reasons why we've seen so many false start rebranding attempts from Google. Uh, Google Assistant, Google Now, uh, Now on Tap, all of these different initiatives, which have all danced around the same kind of let's, or, you know, cards, you know, like we'll, we'll proactively serve you information. We'll try and respond to your needs in real time. We'll try and anticipate your needs in real time. And every, every like year or so, they change something enough that they call it a different product, even though it's all the same general idea. It's Google Voice Search. And you know, we'll put a new name on it and then it's going to feel like a new product and that's going to be exciting and consumers are going to want to try it again. I, I think Apple could actually benefit from some kind of shift. Say, you know, hey, Siri is Siri is evolving into this and we can call it something new and we can move on. And this is a radical new uh, paradigm for your ability to communicate with your phone, even if it's just what would have normally been a very you know minor iteration or iterative improvement it might get people trying their voice assistant on iphones again or, or trying to push the boundaries again and that could give apple much better information as to what they need to do next to keep pace regardless of the big steps that they would want to take in order to revitalize uh, interest in siri they're going to have to still do some of the back the lots the background work basically to get these interactions more i mean well, when you and, think about and, it and, siri was meant to be an airport guide of sorts where yeah. it's, it's very focused <laughs> uh, siri kind of was thing. meant to be a lot of things well, i mean yeah but you know when sri or when it was spun off of sri uh that was their first kind of thing right. and then it was supposed to grow out of it just to you know it was supposed to grow and but grow with the database it had. I, I don't i don't know that there's uh, I don't know that Apple has the patience or the fortitude to actually in-house iterate Siri and improve Siri to where she needs to be. I think we're looking at a, some strategic purchases, some uh, you know such strategic acquisitions, bringing a couple other teams on board. I would really like to see a major manufacturer take a, a hound seriously. Because what a very small team of people were able to do with uh, natural language pr uh, processing and the speed of which Hound can process queries is pretty incredible. It definitely doesn't stand st uh, stack up against Amazon or Google Now in terms of what those platforms are capable of. But just the starting point where Hound was at incorporated into Apple's ecosystem with Siri's backbone could be really formidable and it would catch Apple up a long way towards what consumers expect. If Apple were to acquire Hound, that would be a very interesting uh, um, a move, but uh, I don't think Hound is in that sort of market since they're already, they already have Shazam, uh, which is supposed to really help them out. I think that, and yeah. even then, you know, they're running into roadblocks in terms of the actual acquisition process. So they can't really work anything out of that yet. And with the moves that they've done financially in terms of the repatriation of their profits and whatnot, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's going to be well, a little tight. With, at Apple with repatriating their profits, you could actually say, oh, well, now you can legally spend money in the United States acquiring companies again. Yeah, but they, they have a whole <laughs> bunch of uh, um, uh, share buyback programs that they still want to do. Yeah. So that's why why, why invest in your company and invest in talent and, you know, you know, invest in R&D when you can just buy back stock. Uh, this is uh, this is from Das Otter. Uh, on Twitter using the PN Weekly hashtag, is having multiple offerings for assistance a good thing for customers? In the end, confusion can cripple the user in choosing which one for them. Uh, and is also complaining about my audio. Apparently, there's some delay on my audio, which I'm not surprised because Google Hangouts is awesome. What do you think, Jules? Uh, I, I'm, I'm fairly negative on having multiple voice assistants on one phone. I don't think that really helps anything. 
in terms of that, like stuffing and Alexa and Google Assistant and, oh, here's our own uh, OEM made uh, thing, which I believe, yeah, HTC has done this uh, with the U11. Yeah. It, the, yeah, that was uh, that was interesting. Um well, the U11 yeah, actually was, had three. You you could have. Yeah, yeah. It was the HTC Sense Companion. It was Alexis, uh, Alex, Alexis, Alexa, <laughs> and Google Assistant. So I mean, but you didn't really need all of them at once, and uh, you you they'd be like unitasked, or at least you know, if you could use them, you, they'd have to be very specifically tasked. So uh, and, and, and I don't it's up think to the people... consumer to memorize which service was they don't have the regiment to do that really i i really think that the company that had the best take on this was instead of trying to reinvent the wheel all they did was add a front end and some additional functionality and that was motorola back when google was making their big push for voice actions and controls moto added just a little layer on top but it was the same general backbone and it afforded motorola users just a bit more flexibility like even just retraining the phone to respond to a different hot word you know that wasn't revolutionary change but that meant that the phone was was personalized for you and and you like this the same thing if you're listening to this podcast uh over speakers and you have uh, an echo in your home and i say alexa your echo is gonna respond to it whereas we should be able to at this point retrain the local hardware in a secure fashion so we still maintain security of the platform but so that you can call your assistant of choice by whatever name so that it responds only to you that kind of th that kind of stuff still drives me crazy that we haven't seemed to trigger that kind of uh customization or uh personality and moto had that i what on the the moto x2 <laughs> You know, yeah, like yeah. the droids, uh, the droid turbos, uh, uh, and I remember them slowing down over time. Where you put in a query, uh, and it would just take for like it would log the yeah. notes down, and it would take forever to send it to Google and whatnot. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, but well, uh, hopefully that would be more. I don't think you would be able to integrate it directly, but it would be more seamless uh, these days. Yeah. Well, and hopefully I think there's definitely code pros and cons, too. If you, if you don't make your own voice assistant, then you don't have control over the platform. And I think one of the things that, that, did, that did harm Motorola's approach was making a front end for Google service meant when Google changed things on their service, they would have to adapt to those changes. And sometimes those changes wouldn't necessarily jive with what Motorola was trying to accomplish. And I think that was one of the things that slowed them down. But instead, now what we have is this arms race of reinventing the wheel. There are so many things that I think Bixby does really well, but I'm loathe to use Bixby, especially when there's a dedicated bit of hardware that's their primary method of interaction with Bixby, that stupid little button on the side of the phone that I, I really can't stand. So instead, if there was some way that Samsung and Google could coordinate those efforts just a little bit better, that Samsung phones still have this increased enhanced capability, and Google's probably running to try and incorporate it into a future build of Android, but I would prefer having one way. I, I name my phone Franklin, and I can say, hey, Franklin, I need to do this. Can you pull up this app? And then if it's Bixby or if it's Google Now or a Google Assistant, it doesn't matter. I don't care who actually opens the app and does the thing for me. I just want to be able to talk to my phone and have my phone figure it out. And I still think that was a huge missed opportunity for outlets like IBM. I think IBM could have made a humongous argument for killing the app. Have a digital butler that does everything for you. And you don't have to push square get app to do this thing. You say, hey, uh, you know, hey, IBM Watson, wh what's a good sushi restaurant within two miles of me and book me a table? And it'll go and take care of all of that stuff for me. And I don't have to worry about, you know, futzing with different user interfaces or specific commands. I really think that could have been a huge consumer win if any company at the business sector of this had focused their resources on the commercial market.
Well, speaking of uh, those markets, I want to turn our attention away from those markets, actually, and go into a little bit more specialized into the education market, where Apple is uh, trying to do a little something here uh, with possibly, we've been hearing about a uh, new MacBook Air, but even and cheaper than the current uh, 9.99 price point that um, they have right now, and there's also word of a, a refresh of the regular iPad, the 9.7 inch size, for like 300 bucks kind of deal that we have going mm-hmm. on. Which is, um, I mean, I don't see any people. It's easy to assume that education you know everyone has a macbook uh when you're going off to college <laughs> right and you're in the creative fields right. and whatnot and uh there are ipads too because the apps are all optimized and it's on a big screen and it's you know it's it, it takes people into a very specific uh, kind of uh, experience when they're uh, being educated about something but it's i feel like we're going into the same kind of discussion here with smart assistants whereas you know um siri is being left behind by google assistant and amazon alexa microsoft and google have been optimizing their platforms with the chromebooks and um uh windows 10 s which is going to be a new kind of laptop thing going on um they're going to be uh they're they're changing their ways and uh, they're hoping at, at least google already has a good uh, bit of growth to show for it microsoft's hoping for that too especially with the surface laptop they it seems that that has been performing pretty decently so now it's apple's turn i'm wondering how both of these play into the strategy here i I have a lot more faith in Apple iterating on a new iPad for education rather than a MacBook. I just don't see a lot of excitement from Apple about their current offerings of desktop and laptop computers. Well, isn't so it, so. I mean, <laughs> not to get not to boil this down too much, but wouldn't a seven ninety nine MacBook be? Oh my God, it's Apple! I can get this for a very uh, a very affordable price no and no and, still and, and there's and there's also a part of me that wants to say as soon as you try and youth market like that like this is the macbook for kids going to school immediately that's going to be the least desirable product that apple has ever released and it's kind of like when you make like a kia for the youth market and you advertise it with breakdancing hamsters The majority of people I see driving that car are like senior citizens who are very cost conscious and don't really care about image as much as they wanted, you know, an inexpensive go go to the grocery store vehicle. You or you you script fight. (laughs) Yeah. Or you script a girl uh, in your iPad Pro ad to say, what's a computer? That's that's exactly the point that I'm getting at is Apple's excitement over their product lines. We know a majority of their money comes from iOS. And if they're going to continue to make inroads into education and fight back against some of the negative stim uh negative uh stories that have come out after recent initiatives like la unified using ipads that program crashing and burning in a very expensive and very embarrassing debacle for los angeles uh if if they're going to make that play i think apple probably has more momentum more talent more energy being put behind the ios side of this and i think it's going to be the better argument against all those products that you were mentioning chromebooks and uh windows 10 modular or mobile uh tablet configuration devices right now i think those offer the better bang for buck and if apple seeds that market then it's really difficult to climb back. And so that means that a kid's formidable years where they're educating themselves on technology and consumerism, they're going to have Google products in their hands. They're going to have Microsoft products in their hands. If Apple doesn't have a 299 offering that can compete with a good Chromebook or a good uh, streamlined Windows 10 uh, multi-mode PC, then they're dead in the water. So I think that ad, as cynical as it is and as dumb as it is, that, you know, you've got, what's the computer? Ah! Um, (laughs) It's it's so terrible, and it's so, like, anti-millennial that it makes me want to, like, I don't know. It makes me want to break Apple products. I'm so frustrated by that terrible ad. But it's not wrong from the corporate perspective that that absolutely is i think where they should be focusing their energy 
a couple things I'm worried about with the timing of this uh, uh, release is that one, we're headed into, this is all intended for the next school year, for the next late summer, fall season. And uh, we're only going to be learning about uh, the so- next new software features that might be coming for, you know, educators or for at least the general audience during WWDC in June. And there has been the recent kind of uh, worries about Apple messing about with iOS to engage it for services rather than being a more of a QA uh, smash the bugs kind of thing going on. So there's a whole, there's a worry about software. Now, if they can address that during this event, which is happening in Chicago at a local uh, technical prep high school, um, I mean, I would, I would assume, I would hope that they would address some of these, uh, little things and not just, you know, say code, um, teach people how to code for Swift and, um, like that, that that's, um, I think that would be a good idea. Well, no, I think there's, there's definitely options, definitely potential there too. I, I, I don't know. I, I just kind of feel like Apple's grip on the education market, I don't really feel that they're, I mean, you talking about coding and Swift, I, I don't really feel they're taking advantage of their fashion branding for the education market like they could be. And I think a lot of their momentum is really adults who have a fond relationship with Apple because it just works making purchasing decisions for students. And I don't think that always gels with what would actually be the best opportunity or the best tech to outfit kids with. And I also think that we're going to be seeing a generation of school kids coming up that are going to be significantly savvier about how they're going to interact with data and services coming forward. And eventually they're going to be getting to points where they're they're making decisions for how they're going to interact with educational materials. And it doesn't seem like Apple's really joining that conversation like they could be or like they should be. So one of the platforms that hasn't been joined the conversation in wearables, at least you could make an argument for the our traditional kind of mindset for uh, Android Wear is Android Wear because <laughs> it started out as oh hey let's get all the Android OEMs to make smartwatches is going to be a big thing and then they realized oh uh, people this isn't a, as much of a growth market as it is for us to sustain this kind of thing. Whereas other, you know, the more uh, legacy watch manufacturers, they're all interested. Uh, This is a great way to rejuvenate watch sales for them. And uh, it's, oh, hey, look at this. This is a a screen on a watch. That's pretty interesting. That's new. Um, I'm going to get that as what a 60 70 80 year old or uh, someone who want, you know, want to be fashionable or who has always had a watch. Mm-hmm. That is still kind of a growth vertical for them. So Wear OS, pretty good idea uh, in terms of a name. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how that plays to it with the iPhone bit, but yeah, that's a well, it's, it's a good idea. Well, I, you, look at what we're talking about. We're talking about Google not finding exactly the traction that they wanted cooling off on that market for a short period of time where we haven't heard a lot of really hot Android Wear news. And now they're coming back and rebranding and they're taking away Android because of the, you know, sort of the relationship where people are using Wear watches with iOS and they're calling it something new. Do we really think we're going to be getting some new boundary pushing platform of services and performance. No, it's going to be an iterative improvement over what Android Wear was. The same kinds of little bug fixes and security patches that we were always getting, but they want to have people talking about smartwatch uh, software again. And the an easy way to do that is just to change the name of what that platform is. So I, I like that this does make it feel a bit more inclusive. Any consumer confusion that you could use an Android Wear watch with iOS, this should hopefully help abate those concerns or help re-educate those consumers. But more than anything else, Wear OS, I want to see excitement from Google again. And by calling it Wear OS, To me, this means it should be an operating system you can wear, not necessarily wear on your wrist, 
Maybe we could see some return to Google trying to iterate on a heads up display, uh, something that, you know, we could maybe look at Intel's Vaunt technology. So you don't have the same sort of Borg look with a weird offshoot on your glasses, anything that would move the needle on more organic interactions with brief pieces of information. The watch is a great piece of technology from its earliest inception on the wrist that with a one brief little look, you can get an important piece of information, the time. And now we can also expand that for notifications and health and fitness and a whole range of other things. But tiny little snippets of information up at eye level would be even better. And we 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 all sort of get this. If you're a techie and you're into <clears throat> into these this kind of content, the smartwatch is not a product unto itself. The smartwatch is an evolutionary stepping stone towards some other way of training consumers to interact with products and services, just like the Bluetooth headset isn't really worn anymore. We went through that, we went through that phase and we learned a lot from how people used audio for phone calls, for voice actions. And then we used that to improve the core functionality of the services behind that hardware. The smartwatch is cool. I wear a smartwatch. I like wearing a smartwatch. I hate having my phone make any noise. But as soon as I have something better than the smartwatch, I'm going to go back to a dumb watch or just like a basic fitness tracker or something. And I want my information served up even better than what the smartwatch can deliver. And, and that's where I think we need to build towards. I don't hear that conversation coming from Google. Because I, I it's not that. coming from anyone. It's not coming from it's well, not coming from the companies that want to be involved with it. And it's not coming it's, from the visionaries that would be in Google no, that want no, no, no. to make it change totally within. Is. But but it completely is. It's coming from companies like Garmin, who they're trying to rework how you how you receive information and how you can control information in your car. It's coming from Intel, again, working on a laser projection system for your eyeball. It's coming from Microsoft as they're working into mixed reality services and they're they are iterating this is, this is all right now in the back end when we it's need coming, start wa startups that have that are dealing with hardware AR, at this point and needs and they need to be commercializing and if not google google will not be paying attention to that since they're trying to at least grow subscriber base or grow a user base out of this and those things and, which and are Jules, great you know it's great in the we, background but we need to be able to build that up and Jules, be as what do we know about growing a user and a subscriber base do you put out android wear 2.0 and then completely disappear from the conversation for a year is that how no, you grow it's, that's not how you do that but it's all also, the, so, you have to be able to listen to someone and you, they have to be able to grab attention from Google in the first place. They're right. not really and, grabbing and so attention. So what, what, what did they do that we also criticized Microsoft with Windows Phone? You came out with Android Wear 2.0, you disappeared, you didn't iterate, you didn't provide new functionality. I get these minute little updates that they can change You know the font and they can change some of the layout of my alerts. And then the first big piece of news we get from Google is that, oh, we're going to change the name. And these are all well, of the Android watches works. that will have the name change. Is you there any what? new word on functionality? Is there any new word on no, migrating Wear no OS? Deal about it. Is, is there any conversation that they've learned from consumer behavior with a smartwatch that they can use but that to Android Wear 2.0 was strangled by its by the then current ecosystem of OEMs that said, yeah, no, we're just going to drop this because the, the sales were not helping them. And whatever help that these legacy watchmakers have, had. I think Android you know, they, they, they were doing their own track, but it was like they, they sort of relied on Google to do its own thing. And well, no, with, that's, we, that's not entirely true, though, Jules, because Android Wear 2.0 had Casio, Fossil, Diesel, Huawei. The Huawei Watch 2 was a was an Android Wear 2.0 launch. But also L LG was LG dropped out for a while. Motorola and did. And it got Tommy Hilfiger on board. I mean, like Android Wear 2.0 wasn't strangled. There was more wealth of choice and more wealth of opportunity than Google had ever faced. But for those companies don't and need the Google, software. And Google is responsible for the software. So where was Google for all of those manufacturers? Those those companies don't lead the software and hardware in, right. in the conversation in the terms software. of advancing the form factor. So where They're just doing Google what they know and pasting on all of those manufacturers. Bit. Those manufacturers aren't responsible for the software and the features that Google is supposed to provide them. No, it's not. But they're not. But that feedback loop wasn't 
prone, wasn't uh, making available the innovation that the platform needed. You get what I'm saying? Well, no, 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 no. This is you're, you're you're putting you're putting the chicken way before the egg here. Google is the one who's responsible for dictating what Android Wear is and is not capable of, and so but if they can't just go wants they, they, to put out streamlined hardware that doesn't fully embrace all of the features of Android Wear, it's still on Google to say, well, we've got LTE capability, we've got this capability, we can do this, we can do all day heart rate tracking. And even Google's more direct initiatives, like their partnership with LG, produced very poor experiences for consumers. So that's not on Fossil. It's not Fossil's responsibility it's to not. sell Android Wear's spec sheet to consumers. It's Fossil's responsibility to sell an attractive timepiece. And, and if Google and can't they weren't board, asking for that, and they if Google can't that. iterate, and if Google can't actually move the needle on that, then it's not going to be Tag Heuer. It's not going to be Mont Blanc. It's not going to be Hugo Boss oh, that's no, going to take not. up the techie and geeky side of the discussion to try and make that play. This is this is all on Google, but, but dude. I don't think so because you know, they, when they're not a hardware company, I keep going through this time and time again, and it's the users. I mean, they're not a hardware, the hardware company in the first except place. for speakers and except for a smartphone. That was a mission that was created. After the initiation of Android Wear, when they had pretty much no idea, does the buck stop with the next, Android and the Google, next or, is, or is the is does the buck stop with the people that Google partners with? I think the buck stops with Google. Oh, I'm not saying that the buck stops doesn't stop with Google, but there was no room for growth. There was no room for techno technological. Well, that innovation. is not true because the Apple Watch decimated android and tyson and because, it, Temple, because and they already had there was absolutely ideas. room for growth consumers it was, wanted this it was it was its own hardware and its own <laughs> ideas about what what feedback they had from current users where as the google ecosystem diverse as it is open source as it is, as it is was not really fit it, well, then they, I, everyone I feel we found the fundamental flaw of google strategy if they can't iterate and if they can't support their manufacturing partners then they need to do it themselves and if the pixel is a commentary on smartphones where was their commentary on wearables i don't know <clears throat> again Frankly speaking, i don't know that's on google <laughs> if google wants where to be a success they need to make it a success even microsoft had to dictate what the future of Windows 8 and then Windows 10 was going to be with their own hardware. I don't know where Android Wear 2.0 left Android OEMs with the, the smartwatches initiatives that they didn't follow through with. And but that had let but that took away any data that Google would have used to perhaps retune something well how or so? look at something as, as soon as it's running android wear then you're a part of the google ecosystem and google gets metrics no, 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 on how that's no works. frank no frank customer uses those and again we're talking about different audiences between a, an lg smartwatch and a nixon smartwatch so right yeah, and and even from that limited base, I think we could have Android been, Wear could have evolved yeah. into a more a dumber platform than it already was if it were just based on the, and that's why we haven't seen uh, the fra well, frankly I'm, the the innovation gonna, the, the the software features that we I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put a cap on this because we we do need to to move on, but yeah. I'm gonna put this out to our audience: the success or failure of Android Wear. Is that on the company that makes the services and the software, or is that on the manufacturing partners somehow not living up to the feature set and the software that was provided to them? Drop us a comment, drop us a tweet, uh, hit us up on the YouTubes, on Twitters, or shoot us an email, podcast at pocketnow.com. I'll be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Real quick, Indeed. I do want to cover this HTC U12 because basically it looks like HTC is making an LG V30, and that makes me sad. <laughs> How so? Well, I it's, you know, it's not it's not it's not LG thirty. It's a it's a V thirty combined with what was the freaking like phone that Huawei was pushing around with uh, four mean, cameras? Not not the Mate ten. Uh, no, it was a mid range. It was the Mymon six. And oh it, right, it was like and, yeah, because it was the one that had four cameras. I, I was I was gonna I was gonna say it's basically a, a V V thirty from the back with the dual uh, selfie camera from the V twenty and. I, I, 
if, if oh, I you were just going to stay with LG. <laughs> no, that well, that's what I was going to say is is that that's that to me that's what it, it sort of resembles, and and that to me just sort of kind of further lends credence to my hypothesis that whatever was in the pipeline at HTC, all of the top talent is now over at Google, because this is not particularly inspired uh, smartphone manufacturing and. Well, all <laughs> like of the top just, talent either it, left the company before you know 2016 or has a freaking like they this this phone apparently was in design or some something and for the past what six 12 months so even least, then yeah. yeah that that would you know but that, what, what, it would get even off sadder off. like <laughs> hdc looking at the market and saying hey you know we could rip off the lg g6 <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could I could give LG that much credence. I are you kidding me? This looks exactly like I'm not, I'm not sure about that, man. You're I, not I, sure that this doesn't look uh, exactly the same. It's Jules? like it's like it's like. Dude, are you mad? You are you put, okay? You put the camera. Our viewers and listeners out there using the PN Weekly hashtag. It's a very generic. Up on the email. Uh, whether or not you feel that the the concepts and the mockups for the U12 look exactly like LG's last year of smartphone manufacturing, or is Jules right and that this is just such an organically easy to achieve no, design <laughs> with the little bandit oval mask around a dual camera sensor with a circular fingerprint sensor center mounted right below it? Um, in that's this two by one aspect ratio. Now display. that you explain it like that, that's pretty. I'll be really curious to see what. <laughs> Our viewers say about I mean, the influence of design over the rear you know, of the you got, you got three model. people who are more familiar with you than with me. <laughs> so I would just, I would hopefully take away from that conversation that uh, we have a very strong fan base on pocketnow.com. I, I think you and have we, every opportunity to play your case to the same, <laughs> to the same viewers oh that, no, that I, we both reach out to I every save, week. I saved this stuff for the podcast, man. This is, this is, this is imagination at work. Yes. Yeah, Speaking of imagination, incredible. HTC, let's talk about that. Six inches, 1440p, Snapdragon 845, blah, blah, blah. We've heard these specs before. Um, cameras, 16 and 12 megapixels at the back, which we haven't heard anything about the purpose of uh, those cameras, what results those are designed to achieve. And then there's also Edge Sense, that little thing that was on the Pixel 2 and U11 that where you can squeeze the sides. Um, now, there's going to be a 2.0. We're not sure if there's going to be new hardware or a change in hardware and what that means for its purposing. I'm not sure if this whole experiment with the squeeze uh, uh, interface it has been a success. What do you think? I, I think it's emboldened HTC to continue with that as a gesture just because it was still on the pixel. Like, I, I think that's enough for them to keep it. And because of the way that those teams were re rearranged between HTC and Google, I, I would imagine that they would keep some sort of synergy or consistency in that side of the platform. So, so whether or not we see crazy functionality, it's basically just a, another way of putting a button on a phone, right? I mean, that's all it is. It, it's it's a shortcut. It's a hardware shortcut, and they didn't want to have a Bixby button. And now, having gone back to like the Note Eight for a little while, I, I did some some stuff at Poc uh, at Newegg. Uh, oh, you mean the Note Eight that, that looks exactly like the LG G6? No, the the Note Eight doesn't look <laughs> anything at all like the G6 Jewels. I I feel like you you might it's you might be using camera, the wrong phones. Camera, I, camera, fingerprint sensor, flash. Oh, oh, back. you mean the fingerprint sensor that's offset in a rectangular window to the side of the camera module, as opposed to the raised camera and then, and module and from the V30 and, and the, the circular spine. fingerprint sensor, which sits just below. <laughs> you mean that? The S Is that what you're talking the, about? Fingerprint sensor. As if there was camera, no other camera, way to flash. do dual cameras on the back of a phone or other layouts for where camera, you could put Camera, camera, flash. Oh, where's the fingerprint yeah. sensor? It's in the front. Yeah, that's that's great. 
That's Samsung uh-huh, from the Galaxy S7. They're call- Huawei is copying the right. Samsung of 2015, man. You didn't the know Samsung that. Samsung of 2015. Jules, but- I really don't trust your eye for design. So um, <laughs> we should probably hit up uh, our sponsor right quick as we're getting into the midpoint of the show. Sure about that? <laughs> and uh, this, this week's episode of the Pocket Now Weekly is brought to you for, by the Google Cloud Platform. And what can your data tell you? With Google Cloud Platform, use machine learning at scale to build better products. Google Cloud's AI provides modern machine learning services with pre-trained models and a service to generate your own tailored models. Our platform is now available as a cloud service to bring unmatched scale and speed to your business applications. It predicts so your business can thrive. Click now to learn more about Google Cloud Platform or go to g.co slash getcloudai. And we thank them for supporting the Pocket Now Weekly. Peter Hayton on Twitter. I'm agree. I, I'm afraid. I, I can't even say it. I'm afraid I agree with Juan. This time you're just wrong. As, as, oh. uh, as mine would be. Wrong in, in my last name which is a uh, lovely hashtag PN weekly uh, continue the conversation over there. I, I know your opinions already, but Hey, I'm just, I'm just here. I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to leave this up to the democracy of our viewers as to whether or not smartphone design has become so generic. Now, are you, that, are you saying look. this as, as, I, as the goal I'm of not changing my mind, this conversation, Jules, I'm, I'm leaving changing this my mind. Why what, now you, you are, are like, if, sure, sure. But you're not going to change my mind about it just because it's all generic. I, like, this is, like, I, this is I, what you have to do to not play concerned about changing your mind. If our viewers say, you're you know, wrong. what was a unique design and a unique <laughs> concept, the L 16 from whatever company that you like, you had you the whole nitro. No, not the Lytro, the L16, which had right. 16 the, cameras on its back. If it was made by Lytro, then yeah, sure, Lytro. The, the company you're talking about is Lytro. That's, I, that's not, no, that's not, that's not a debate, it's Jules. Light. I know it's you want to fight me on a it's bunch light. of stuff this week. It's light. But it's... It's light. Lytro made the Lightfield camera, but light made the L16. Light made the L16. Okay. I mean, that's, cool. a, that's a fact. Not fake news. But what does that have anything to do with HTC obviously ripping off the V30? Like, obviously. I, I, I was, well, I was trying to make a transition over to Broadcom and Qualcomm because the news this week is that <laughs> President Donald Trump, you're not, you're not, I know you've given up all in like assumption or of yes and here. I was trying to. This you made the ad break, and then I and then we got went on to the second I, segment. I I can't yes and when I have no idea where you're going with that, Jules. Uh, but you're right. We probably should talk about Broadcom because that is a really big deal <laughs> in the world of business. Again, it's a continuing story that we've been watching unfold, and I think with a lot of trepidation, there are people who've been concerned about these mega corporate mergers and this is looked like a fairly hostile acquisition so at the same time that we started getting stories out that intel could be uh getting into this race and looking at qualcomm uh politics on this have gotten have gotten viscerally uh, aggressive with the trump administration reaching out to say uh they they would not be uh in, in favor of this or they would be outright banning uh, the potential of an acquisition and very you know, uh, two days ago, Broadcom yeah. complying with the Trump order and walking away as seemingly completely walking away from their plans to try and acquire yeah, Qualcomm. This, this was a pretty, what what uh, do you think will be the ramifications on this? Because it looks like it leaves Qualcomm yeah. in an actionable position. Like it looks like now Qualcomm could be up for grabs from any other major corporations that wanted to throw their hat, hat into the ring, too. Well, I was just about to say that this was a pretty interesting week in terms of the troughs and peaks of the drama around this deal because Intel doesn't necessarily have an interest in um, you know Qualcomm itself. It is worried about Broadcom. Uh, I think Intel has its hedges against Qualcomm in terms of Apple because it's uh, doing its own modems and it's also working towards five G. Uh, and with but with the biggest. Uh, uh, client that you could have with apple um they have their interests there they're going to stick with it meantime if if broadcom were to put into uh, put itself into the picture with qualcomm um i'm not sure exactly how 
that would actually work out since the assumed uh, position that Broadcom would take was that, oh, they're not really going to invest in 5G and that would leave Intel fighting off against other companies like a lot of Chinese uh, firms, uh, Huawei, uh, TSMC, uh, perhaps uh, more. And uh, that would really shake up things in the sector and would leave 5G more towards, uh, manipulated more towards um, China, which the U.S. would have an interest in keeping the definitions and the standards of internet uh, uh, Mm -hmm. protocols away from that since they consider them a big security threat. Especially not only just from the corporate perspective, but also our government and law enforcement perspective too. Oh yeah, totally. This is is intertwined here. So like, let's uh, start back with uh, the um, Broadcom here because they announced this week that they were going to re-domicile from Singapore to the U.S. uh, in April. And that was one month Early that was they previously announced that they were going to read domicile in May, and now it was going to be April. And you know what date that they were uh, going to read domicile on? April third. That is just two days after uh, uh, before Qualcomm's rescheduled shareholder vote mm-hmm. on uh, the 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 board of directors, which Broadcom has a big interest in, and a ballot of uh, nominees ready to go. Uh, and that rescheduling was due to Qualcomm, uh, the, the the deal being investigated by uh, the Committee on Foreign Investments in the U.S. And they were going to look into this. And Broadcom has been very hostile against uh, Qualcomm in this respect because they said that since they're re-domiciling in the U.S., C- uh, C- uh, the C- uh, CFI U.S., doesn't have jurisdiction over them and wouldn't have jurisdiction uh, over them after the redomiciling happens. And with that move of making the uh, redomicile date earlier than expected, well, that kind of triggered the CFI US to advise Trump, at least in my view, to advise Trump that this deal may be happening. And Trump said, all right, yeah, sure. Let's uh, uh, put the kibosh on this. So, there was a lot of gesturing from Broadcom's part, and um, it just didn't work out with them. So, I think one of the interesting parts of the commentary coming out on this, uh, and thanks for that recap, uh, I've, I've noticed a lot of people talking about Qualcomm being able to breathe easy, or this Broadcom merger, this Broadcom acquisition is not going through, and so now Qualcomm shareholders don't have to worry about pressure from other venues. With Intel aggressively getting into the radio space, uh, working with Apple for modems, I really think this makes Qualcomm look like it's still not completely strong enough to fend, not strong enough to fend off an outside influence trying to acquire their base. And I think Intel would be a company that our current administration, our current government, wouldn't necessarily be as afraid of them acquiring Qualcomm and that that would lead to this, you know, again, this mega team up, this mega force that could exert a lot of pressure over the future of 5G standards and protocols. I think there's still a much quieter possibility of Qualcomm getting optioned by a player like Intel. I think with the baggage that they have already with the uh, antitrust uh, lawsuits from Apple and all the other regulatory agencies uh, for their prior practices of just, you know, holding over CDMA chips above uh, clients' heads without, you know, if they didn't agree to the certain contract, like that's being debated right now. It's not, it, it's, well, it's not sure to take a big hit on Qualcomm, it's definitely a specter over their heads. Yeah. And that is going to be a big factor in whether a company like Broadcom is that could be aggressive in its investments and is willing to, you know, cut down on, you know, make big, uh, big upfront purchases, big upfront right. expenses to deal with all these kinds of things in order no, to. I, 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 I'm not saying it's very likely, and 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 again, we would we would see a lot of noise on this front, and I'm sure other other regulatory agencies would get involved. I'm just saying, I think there is the outside chance that if Broadcom got this close, I don't think 
Apple would be too upset if Intel pushed the button on acquiring Qualcomm and they already had a working relationship with Intel. The psychology on that, I think, would be a lot different than Broadcom making the play uh, again. Total speculation. There is no evidence to support that Intel is trying to move into that space with that kind of play. I just think because Broadcom showed how close they could get to forcing an acquisition, uh, forcing uh, Qualcomm to the table on this, that I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that another player, I, I mean, I'm bringing up Intel as a specific company, but I, I, anyone with deep enough pockets could also make the same I mean, play. Intel is is the, the specific company. It's the number one in the world. And I think because of their failures in the cellular uh, cellular uh sector you know they uh, not being able to get 3g or 4g uh properly to uh uh mm -hmm. their clients and it's just th this makes sense they would be able to argue that this is a different uh sector that they they could work in and uh, hopefully appease uh uh regulars and regulators in their view right. um it, it, it's plausible it's very plausible um and uh, but otherwise i don't see tsmc i don't see if you no. keep going down the list you no, know actually it's just... the, the the company that just popped into my head that it would be hilarious like i would support this acquisition just for the comedy potential of like apple walking in and just paying cash <laughs> 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 like Apple's had so many problems with Qualcomm, they just say, F it, we're just gonna buy you. <laughs> and then they, just like, and they just walk in with briefcases and briefcases and briefcases full of money, and they just go, Here, we'll 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 fix this problem right now. And we're done. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that would be hilarious and great. And you know, I it would it would be a circus act. Um the problem now, what I would see with a uh, problem with that is just again, Apple would probably only use it as a parts farm, and oh, would, totally. you know, no, I mean it, it doesn't even make sense for Apple to have that kind of portfolio under their purview. It really doesn't. It's just to me, it's it's that like it would be hilarious, scene, you know, like uh, oh, you wouldn't you wouldn't help me buy clothes while I went to a competitor. Big mistake. Uh, <laughs> it, it, like it would be the 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 sort of you know Apple's final kiss off to their relationship with Qualcomm. They're just, just gonna acquire it for them. the sake of selling it again exactly. in, in, in <laughs> chopping them up like Richard Gere. I have no idea why I have Pretty Woman on the brand. I need to watch that. Movie again. <laughs> it's hilarious. I have not seen that. All right. Well, I should watch more with uh, Richard Gere then. I, I am, I, you know, I, I very much enjoy uh, Richard Gere's performances. I think he's a, a, an accomplished and a capable actor and surprisingly good tap dancer. As uh, someone who studied some tap, uh, he's not bad. You should check out Chicago. It's good times. <laughs> I don't know what I'm seeing here in terms of uh, this this formula on uh, the uh, hashtag PN Weekly. U12 Plus, uh, of course, from um, Vinny Effing Madrix uh, equals LG GV20. Minus, minus six minus two divided by 30. And that's what the U12 Plus is. I think it's pretty clear that uh, Vinny is saying that the U12 no, I mean, yeah. is basically the unholy love child of the LG G and V series uh, minus a couple of their numbers. I, I mean, totally. It's just, you know, I, I really want to take the formula seriously for a second. And four divided by 30. No, two, 30. That's, fi that's a 15th. And then six minus the 15th is five and 14 fifteenths. So I don't know where that's going. But um, yeah. Good, good well, job. But, but wait a minute. What's the Roman numeral for G? For five. G. Well, it's 400. not really a Roman numeral. No. What? G the is Roman numeral G is interchangeable with the Roman numeral P, which was, I believe was 400. So what is that? 400 minus five. Oh, God. Roman numeral G. Gosh. Well, I, 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 I mean, like, I want to make sure I have that right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it up right now. Um, well, I, would, I, would, I would hope it's like CD because that would be 400. Uh, in any case, uh, I want to ask you one more question, or at least, or this this question at least from uh, who is it? Uh, the the meme Wranglot, uh, who asked, uh, which phone from MWC 2018 would you be uh, most happy to molest? I mean what was the <laughs> like that was the that was the joke he was making like it was like oh no i can't say that um 
something else. Uh, have a hands on, I guess. Uh, what 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 would be yours? Um, actually, I'm I, so. I mean, the Galaxy S nine is being really well covered right, right now. I am really apprehensively. Uh, I, I don't want to use the word like apprehensive. I'm I'm very concerned and very uh, interested in seeing what Sony can pull off this year. Uh, I I keep coming back to how much I enjoyed spending time with the Xperia uh, XZ1 Compact and watching them shift up their design and go to a two by one aspect ratio display. I, I want to see like does this really solve some of the problems that consumers say they have with the brand? Or is this really like, is this kind of a lost cause at this point? People have figured out the team that they're on and you can't really change minds or increase market share just by adopting the same specs as other companies. So they're, they're actually the company I'm most interested in spending a little time with right now. Mm. I, I really still want a Nokia phone, uh, the new age, you know, fast Android updates and yeah. all that stuff. So, and I feel like for me, you know, as a tough and, you know, going guy, uh, probably the Nokia seven or seven plus, um, it, right. like a, it's a mid ranger, but it's, you know, it's not, it's, it has that kind of some somewhat unique design. Again, I, I, I like, I really don't have the eye for for taste or whatever. Um, but in terms of, the, I mean, when, when you hear me describe the HTC U12 as being, oh, it's it's a fingerprint sensor with two cameras on it, like that, and the and all other phones are like that too, like that. Oh, that's that's. Way, it, I know we're not really following his formula exactly because you should be doing PEMDAS, but uh, Roman numeral G minus V minus six minus two divided by thirty equals twelve point nine. So that would be twelve plus. Well, I mean, I, I would I would have used a G uh, for a thousand because that's the like the usual kind of uh, um, assignment well, it gets. Grand isn't, isn't that M? Well, no, that's Roman numerals, but uh, but G isn't really a, t a traditional Roman numeral for anything. Um, CD Except would be four hundred. It's the Roman numeral for four hundred. CD is four hundred. Well, that's Man. one, yeah, but you could also just write G. That's, I mean, I'm I'm looking at it right here on the internet. So, it, I obviously no one's lying on the internet. Obviously, no one is lying on the internet, man. No one ever lies on the internet. Why, why would they? Uh, what, Roman what? numerals I V X L C D M. That's 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 all I see here. Alternative forms. My goodness, <clears throat> that's, so, that's anyway. this is crazy. All right. Um, basically, hole Vinny over. says I'm right. So that's that's the most important takeaway from our little deep dive. In it's 12.9, and so that Which means is almost 13. Yeah, 12 plus. It's almost 12 13, plus. but not quite. So 12 yeah. plus. That's that's, right. a, that's a great idea. I mean, but it's it's just so common. It's like it's like freaking countdown, and you have to get 12.9 from a whole bunch of meaning, like oddly meaning symbols. Mm -hmm. gosh yeah Ugh. good times so uh we do have a couple other uh comments here uh is it time for the conundrum Kovic, yet who's wanting uh an axon eight i am definitely on board i really hope we axon see nine from axon AP. nine well I, just any follow-up to the axon <clears throat> as a proper straightforward flagship especially if especially if they can keep up with some of that audio would be axon 7.1 epic <laughs> Um, Axon G minus four thousand five hundred. Jim Brimble uh, using the PN Weekly hashtag. I've been thinking for the last ten minutes. Why doesn't Apple just buy Qualcomm and then you went and said it? That would be hilarious. Um, it, I had one other comment here that I wanted to get to. Uh, oh, get get to it, please. Come on, you can do it. I can get back. There was, I mean, it was. I was going back. Oh, it was a. Uh, uh, we we got this really great little conversation going on Twitter just about IBM Watson and how IBM kind of fell apart in that regard. Unfortunately, it's uh, a couple people moving back and forth, so uh, I, I can't read all of those tweets. But uh, you know, I think it's just more evidence that this space hasn't been decided yet on how you interact with a smart assistant, uh, digital machine learning, AI, whatever you want to call it. But we watch companies build up a, a whole bunch of mind share in that arena and then never seem to capitalize on it. I look at Microsoft with HoloLens. I look at IBM with Watson. 
some really high concept stuff. And then when consumers finally get their hands on stuff, they're using competing products, which are probably not as good, but you know, no one's actually making stuff for those consumers. So it's just a shame that they tend to fall apart just as they get to the finish line. So I'm, I, I know I'm going to incriminate myself one more time, but uh, back to design for one second and back to HTC. Uh, I, I think Cher Wong, uh, uh, like one of the undercover things that we uh, couldn't, uh, or no one paid attention to basically uh, back at MWC 2018 was her uh, keynote. And uh, Cher Wong, the chairman, uh, chairwoman of uh, the company said that maybe 5G because of the miniaturization of uh, all the parts and you know eventually we'll have all the parts so that um the phone doesn't have to be the slab or something it could be any uh, any other shape like a, and we've seen experiments uh with a uh, runcible with a circle uh i i just want something to be another shape i just want a triangle i want like a hexagon <laughs> or something foldable you know like that that's what i want to see that's what, in the end. That's my main message here. So, um, just do something with the X and Y planes, and uh, go and like bring some Z into it. You know, I, I don't disagree. I just think by the time we start getting to well, and and this is actually we we talked about this uh, either last week or the week before the the notion of Android P actually giving manufacturers and developers better tools and better capabilities for Android to intelligently recognize the the the, the display the form factor and resolution that it has on tap could help usher in I, I I think circles could be really interesting to play with too um, in the meantime though if we change the shape of the phone I still don't think that completely addresses I think it would be exciting and I think it would be fun, but I don't think it still completely addresses the sort of paradigm and the metaphor that we use to interact with services. I think the only way we really move the needle on improving the ergonomic and the social etiquette surrounding data in our constant face is to get away from holding slab o glowing rectangle up to face and blocking out the rest of the world around us. And that's why I'm way more excited by AR and, uh, heads up display initiatives, getting that information organically into the places where our eyes are supposed to be looking and uh, seeing if we can keep those interactions as efficient and as brief as possible. So uh, I'll be really curious to see where that comes from. I think there's a huge opportunity for a true disruptor in this space. Now that smartphones have all kind of agreed, we're rectangular slabs of glass on glass and that's how the phone works. I think a company has a chance to come in and say, well, but we could do something different. And every time we've gotten comfortable, that's where we've gotten the original iPhone or, you know, Android has walked into the space or the PC has been revolutionized or game consoles have become living room computers. Every time we've gotten complacent, that's when something really shakes up the market in a way that we weren't expecting before. What we need is a, a, a nil from the YouTube chat, which I've just been able to pull up and read the tiny print on it. Perhaps a modern retake on the uh, Sony Clio with modern specs and Android or Sailfish running on it. But, you know, it's well, what I was mean, the so, Sony Clio shape like? Yeah. Uh, the, well, I mean, there were a couple different Clias, weren't they? I mean, I think he's talking about the one that had the flip around screen that had like a little a vertically mounted QWERTY keyboard. With the Clio? Um, um, no, not... I don't think Sony made that. I no. Um, it was a the, the PDA thing. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is wasn't that it was? Well, I mean, well, the, that, the, the the Clio was the PDA thing. Yeah, that's right. But I'm not sure what well, the Clio. So no, no, no. Is. I think I think there. I think there were. Oh, I don't know what a Clio. Oh, I didn't hear you say Clio. I don't know what a Clio is, but I do believe there were two different Clios. One was sort of a Star Trek communicator form factor, and one was like a teeny tiny micro laptop um, mm. form factor. Uh, but I think they both, the, the Clie was built all about having the flip around screen. So before Lenovo did the twist, you had, you know, you opened it, flipped the screen around, closed it back down and it was just a regular Palm pilot. Then you could open it, flip it, and you'd have a keyboard that you could hide under the, uh, under the display. Mm, yeah, that's, uh, we need more of that, honestly. I mean, not, I would have liked the Gemini if it, it but I only got like the first, uh, freaking, 
uh, prototype or like the pre-production unit that I had. So I could test out the keys properly. And I found it to be kind of sad uh, in terms of the type of experience. So, uh, and it's just uh, unwieldy for me in general. So nothing that large, please, anyone. <laughs> well, and and I think there's another. I, I spent a couple days trying to make an HTC Touch Pro, a Windows mobile uh, slider keyboard phone, my daily driver. But there was something that I loved going back. <clears throat> Windows Mobile, it's basically a pocketable form of Windows XP uh, in, in a form factor that was just a teeny bit bigger than a Nokia candy bar. I would really like to go back to that, having a smaller but thicker phone that could expand shape in some way and offer up you know sort of a streamlined experience when i need it a more robust experience and then augment that with a smart assistant ai or heads up display in my glasses something else where i could move more pieces of, of information around and i could use that more modularly with all of the other accessories that i already am going to be investing in there was something really charming about going back to that form factor and i i wish it was something we could still experiment with today i'm I am getting a little tired of like, well, we've got another six inch screen phone and it's a two by one aspect ratio and it's glass with a glass back and that's how you make a phone. I I, I think that's going to feel like the death of the smartphone as a platform if our design stays that stale. <laughs> so we let's uh, hopefully something will make us excited in uh, smartphones again in terms of industrial design. But until then... Um, I guess they get to keep boring us in the way that they want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's just it. That's, that's what I was saying before. If if the the revolutionary and disruptive change doesn't come from a Samsung or doesn't come from an Apple, it's going to come from someone else. So this year, I think it'll be interesting to see where they put resources towards to hopefully capitalize on doing something that really does shake up the market. And I have every every belief that a Samsung could do that. It's just whether I, I, I have a concern over Apple because of how safe they need to keep iOS for their revenue. But I think any company could conceivably do something that would that would take consumers by storm. It's just how much risk are they willing to engage with? And uh, one more question uh, here from uh, Fat Produce. Hey, Jules, what phone would you use for the old phone challenge? Oh boy, um, this is going to be a tough one for me, and I haven't fought this one completely through. Um, the, the parameters would have to be set really weird, but maybe perhaps the Nexus One. I'd love to see, you know, proto Android stage kind of development. Yep. You know, pre. It's, I mean, when um, I'd be curious about Windows Mobile or even uh, Palm OS as well, but um, you know, at least you know they're, they're the backbone to those things would be less familiar to me and would be and it would be more limited to what i'm already used to yeah and while like i know you know the old phone challenge you know you're supposed to you know restrict yourself and 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 enjoy the experience as it is as presented but i don't know it's still <laughs> once you go go back there it's kind of a foreign land to me a way too foreign land that I've had no well, that's, that's also I think what's sort of charming about checking some of that stuff out is you know we, we've we've come a long way <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah it's a I, I I think you know going back that far it's it, it is it's it's like we had a completely different metaphor and a completely different user experience in mind than what we arrived at today and the assumptions and the predictions that we were making back then really have nothing to do with the current uh, consumer commodity device that we all have to carry around with ourselves today. Mm, indeed, I th yep. I think I enjoyed this show. Uh, we had a it we had one trivial one of our spicier shows. Yeah, one trivial argument and then one kind of uh, su you know sub substantive uh, volley going on there. It was very nice. <laughs> Well, uh, and and uh, we would definitely hope that folks join that conversation. Shoot us some comments, shoot us some messages, hit us up with some emails. I I I, I want to hear what you guys have to say about 
our various topics of discussion and debate. But folks, this episode of the Pocket Now Weekly is now over. Uh, the conversation continues on Twitter, on email, uh, on various uh, messaging platforms of your choice. You can catch Jules as at point Jules on the Twitters, and I'm humbly at some gadget guy. Pocket Now is around the web on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google Plus, YouTube, our home site, pocketnow.com. And if you speak the Spanish, check out es.pocketnow.com. Shows like this cannot exist without your support. Sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and dropping reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever else a podcast review can be left. Once again, we want to thank this week's sponsor, the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, definitely check out what their services can mean for your business. They're helping us keep the lights on here, but ultimately there would not be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness. So make sure you tune back in. What can your data tell you? With Google Cloud Platform, use machine learning at scale to build better products. It predicts so your business can thrive. Click now to learn more about Google Cloud Platform or visit g.co slash getcloudai.